Okay, welcome to another edition of the Gun Den. And uh, on this video, we're going to do uh, a little short video on the uh, FN 49, the SAFN, uh, made by, uh, by Fabrique National in uh, Belgium. And uh, this is actually an Egyptian contract gun. Uh, it's an 8 by 57 or 8 millimeter Mauser. And uh, you can kind of tell by the Egyptian crest. I'll kind of hold it here. We can kind of see the Egyptian crest on the uh, on the receiver. Uh, this one's in pretty nice and pretty good shape. This is not the original stock, obviously. Uh, it uh, I think some of these guns were uh, manufactured and or, or many of the parts were taken and new stocks were gotten for them and uh, they were assembled uh, in the, back in the 90s. And I think that's probably where this gun actually. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously the. The gun was made in uh, in the 50s in in, uh, in Belgium, and then uh, these stocks were put on at a later time, and then they were marketed over here in the United States as, as uh, military surplus. But well, a lot of the, the issue is that was the main ones you'll see redone by by Century Arms is the the Egyptian contract ones because the conditions of the Egyptian deserts are actually so rough, and the handling that they took you know with the military uh, actually broke a lot of the stocks, and that's why they had to get this. Italian beech wood and actually redo it and fix the butt plates because they were just all beat up and not really usable and not worth much uh, in the condition they were in to be sold to the surplus market. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we ended up we ended up uh, acquiring this thing. We've shot it some, and uh, like I say, uh, the bar the 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 bore and stuff looked really good. Uh, on initial shooting, we uh, we had zero troubles with it up till about maybe 50 or 60 rounds, and uh, we, then we had a couple of uh, cases stick in the chamber. I think I'm going to attribute that to a couple of things. Uh, we didn't probably clean it out as well as we should have. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when we got it, uh, it looked good. We uh, did look, you know, we cleaned it up a little. We took it apart. We did clean it. Uh, didn't probably scrub the chamber out as good as it should have. But uh, it worked flawlessly, and then uh, I think it was getting hot. We were using Russian surplus ammo and uh, steel cased with coating. And uh, I've, I've read a lot of people say that sometimes they get hot and the coating gets gooey and sticks in it. And I think that was most of our troubles. We cleaned it out real good, and we've shot it again and had zero troubles out of it. It's a real nice mm -hmm. shooter. Uh, similar to the M1 Grand, I think, as far as uh, the feel and shoot of it. I, I actually think it. I actually think the recoil is a little lighter on this gun in the eight millimeter. I know they also made a few guns in thirty uh, six. Venezuelan ones were in seven millimeter, which is and they're cool. Yes, and they kick. You know, they would obviously be a little lighter kicking. So, mm -hmm. uh, but all around, this is all around. This has been a good shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's accurate, and uh, and uh, pretty 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 nice gun. Pretty nice gun. So, uh, I think we're just going to kind of. Maybe show you just a little bit about how to take it down and, and uh, take it apart and kind of just field strip it. Yeah. We'll kind and of, uh, another thing to note with relation to the M1 Grand, this actual full length of this rifle is actually a couple inches longer and it's a couple pounds heavier. So in terms of feel, the, the F in terms of if you're wanting to shoot standing straight up, you're going to have a little bit more. I'd say it's a little harder to keep on target than the M1 is uh, if you're doing offhand shooting there, but they're pretty similar. And this one has less recoil due to its weight and the, the gas system it uses for recoil there. Yeah, and I guess I guess and it was it was uh, a little safety check just to make sure there's nothing nothing in the uh, chamber, nothing in the barrel there. So, uh, but yeah, it uh, it it has a little different. It has a it has a box magazine, but it's not detachable uh, on this particular on the Egyptian guns or not. I think some so of them were. The Venezuelan ones had like twenty round detachable ones, so it varied, I guess, depending on what the military of the, particular nation wanted and yeah, what their I'm needs not, were. And I'm not sure exactly how many this one holds. Do you remember? This one holds 10. 10. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking it was 10. It's either 10 round non-detachable or a 20 round detachable or the two different variations of magazines. Uh, and it's, uh, that were made for it. It's also, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the, you know, the M1 has the end blocks. Uh, these were made for stripper clips. As you can see the slide in right mm -hmm. there and, and push them in. And of course, uh, once you get the first stripper clip, the second stripper clip can be a little fiddly, you know, in terms of, you know, but tough uh, to get in, tough to get in. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and like an M1, uh, I will tell you that, uh, it hadn't got me yet, but 
you're loading, especially if you're loading stripper clips and putting a lot of pressure down in there, you better keep your hand behind the bolt because, uh, boy, when it decides to go, when it decides to go home, it, it flat mm -hmm. goes. So uh, just like on the M1, keep your thumb out of there because it uh, it's liable to go shut at any time. They uh, say FN thumb is worse than M1 thumb. I probably attribute that to, it looks like the the force and the, the way of that receiver crashing for it, I think it's probably a little more than the M1 is. A little bulkier looking. I think that might kind of be why. Yeah, you gotta watch out. That thing looks like it slams forward pretty quickly. Yeah, you, you, don't want you, your, you don't want your finger in there. Yeah, no. And uh, to release it, of course, it's just standard. Put down the push down the. Little oh, I meant to there mention uh, there's your uh, cocking indicator on the uh, on the trigger FN, guard yeah. on the trigger guard the front of the trigger guard and you'll see mm -hmm. that uh, goes away when that uh, is down. Your safety uh, kind of blocks your. I think it's a it's a good safety. I think. Yeah, it is. You can't hardly get to the trigger if you're, so if you're if right handed. If you also. forget. You yeah, know. I guess for a lefty it'll be a little different, but it is a little different for a lefty. But and that's pretty nice on it. Uh, a lot. Dust cover. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a dust cover uh, for the slide, and it does have uh, the nice military sights on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, graduated. These are in Egyptian. I think it was up to uh, nine hundred. I think. I think so. So you just kind of. It's figure. got Egyptian lettering though. So <laughs> yeah, I mean. I guess you I'm just, just count it. I'm <laughs> assuming that's by hundreds. I'm but. assuming that's, either, um, I don't know if it's yards or meters, whatever the Egyptians yeah. use. Or, uh, but uh, anyway, when, it's, when, meters, but, when it's all the way back uh, at 100 yards, it shoots great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a, that was uh, kind of what we found out about it. Definitely. And, uh, well, this was considered, you know, kind of a, a the European answer to the M1 Garand. Um, it kind of missed the mark, though, I'd say. It missed the World War II mark a little bit, but that was just due to the FN factory getting actually occupied and started being used for making production. They started making weapons for the, the Wehrmacht. And that's when, you know, the Nazis invaded Belgium. So the FN guys actually, Dudon Saeed, which is the guy that actually came up with this and finished Browning, uh, the Browning high power design. They actually Same had to guy. flee to, to Europe or to, to England to actually go and, continue to work on getting this rifle finished. Um, they didn't, they couldn't really work on it as well as they wanted to because all the England's resources was diverted to, you know, the weapons they were already making and the the English government didn't really feel like it was necessary or really practical to put a lot of money into this man's design at the time. So only a couple prototypes were made throughout World War II and post-World War II they were able to go back to their factory but the good thing about it is it actually hadn't been bombed like a lot of other factories had been during the war. So they actually still had their structure and within a couple of years they were back up to full production again. And that's when these rifles started kind of coming onto the market. So, you know, post World War II, there's a lot of World War II surplus guns, you know, imagine that. And so there wasn't a lot of buyers for this. Uh, there's a lot of smaller countries like, you know, Belgium, Luxembourg, Argentina, Venezuela, which I know some of those aren't as small. Um, and then Egyptian. In total, there's about 175,000 leads made. 125,000 were in 30 out six caliber. So the eight millimeter is actually more of a rare variation of it, which is kind of cool. The uh, another thing, the the Belgian models of these were actually actually had a fully automatic. They had select fire on, so they I don't know how effective that would be though with the 10 round capacity, but you might get off a couple well concentrated bursts there, but. I don't know how practical that was, but that's yeah. something cool. And the Venezuelan ones also had a flash hider on them, and were in seven millimeter, which is kind of cool. The Belgian ones and Luxembourg ones were in thirty out six, and the Egyptian was the one was the only one in, in eight millimeter, which is kind of a cool little deal. So different calibers, you know, but uh, this is that was the only buyer she was able to get in post World War II Europe, and you know America wasn't looking for a firearm either, so that's kind of all they could get, you know. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, we checked it. Uh, we did check the chamber, and uh, now we've done that. The way to uh, the way to take this thing down for field stripping is there's a little tab on the back of it. Yeah. You kind of flip that all the way up to where it's straight up on there, and then uh, the bolt you want the bolt closed. It's, it'll have some spring pressure on it, and there's a little lever on the side that you push. A little indentation you can get. And on this one, it's kind of it should go forward up and back out of course there's a spring you got to kind of it's got a spring tension on it pretty good shape hammer. it's come a little ways but it still likes just a little bit yeah. 
There we go. There we go. Get up and off. There she goes. Now she's up and I'll just back it up. There you go. There we go. And there's your there's yeah. the top of it. There's your spring. Here's your recoil spring there. Yeah. Right Pull there. that out. Now your bolt assembly. Mm-hmm. I'll just slide right back. There's some grooves in here and you'll notice. You'll just slide that right back. And it'll just come right and your back. Whole, whole bolt, bolt, bolt assembly. Carrier group should just bolt carrier group just come out. Of course, that's just a little cover right here and then your actual bolt's up underneath there. Yes. A little hood for it there. All right, that's got your, pretty well your receiver open there where you can clean up there. And if you want to take your, uh, if you want to drop this down, this has a little catch on it right back here. It'll swing down for your magazine, but uh, the the uh, the spring and the carrier in there are not. They'll come out too. So yes. So if you take that There's apart, that. I'm not gonna do that right now. But if you if you want to clean it up down in there, take when you take this pin, you push this and it will release down. Mm -hmm. When it does, mm -hmm. you'll be you'll be ready to catch all the uh, all the parts that come out. <laughs> And now we're going to move to the, <clears throat> now the gas assembly. Gas assembly here. And the way that works is there's, your gas block is right here and it's got a push button on it from the, I'm pushing it from the bottom. You just push that and rotate that. It's, it's really tough on this one sometimes. You rotate it to the right, I believe, on this one. Let's see if I can get a little bit better of it. Use my Glock tool, works on lots of things. All right, pop it up to the right, and there's your gas plug, mm -hmm. right there. And then shake it down, throw it this way a little bit. Give me that. There we go, and here comes the top rod. There we go. And the spring. There you go. And there you go. And uh, like I said, if you shoot any corrosive ammo in it at all, uh, you know, every time you do, you need to pull this and this also, this rod, and, and clean it up pretty, pretty quickly after you shoot it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it, uh, corrosive ammo is really... Well, there's a lot of fiddly things about this gun we were talking about before we started filming, and I think you should maybe touch on some of those just for people that might be wanting to get one of these or has one and hasn't really gotten to shoot it that much. The what now? The we'll talk about the different what ammos you need to use for. Yeah, you know? the ammos. Uh, a lot of people say you know don't use the uh, I believe it's the Turkish ammo. It, the Turkish ammo was made for bolt gun for bolt for Turkish Mausers is really what it was made for, and uh, it's got a slow burning powder. So with a slow burning powder it, with this gas system it just doesn't work well on most of that. So a lot of people say use the I think the Yugoslavian ammo they say surplus mm -hmm. is good and the Russian. It's good. The one thing about most of the stuff that we've been able to find is the steel cased. If you can get brass, non-Turkish brass, from what I can tell, that's probably the best. Because if you go with steel cased, they're going to have a polymer coating of some sort. You fire the gun more than two or three times, uh, <laughs> you're going to get a buildup in your chamber, which is going to lead to sticky cases. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just they, how well, that's just how it is. And uh, so if you're going to shoot that ammo, no big deal, it shoots fine, but uh, like we've set up, we've got us a rod we take with us now. So if one does get stuck, you can pop it out oh, of there pretty right, quick yeah. and uh, oh, well, just irritate it. Yeah, you know, your your lacquer gets heated up in there and creates a gummy turns into, type of yeah. substance and then your casing gets stuck. It turns and into glue. Your ejector mm -hmm. rod, or your ejector can't get the, the casing out. Yeah. And it'll end up ripping off the back end of your shell, you know. If you're yeah, not... this thing has a heck of an extractor on it because it, it ripped off <laughs> yeah. some, uh, hit some, uh, cases yes. trying to get a couple out which could also break your extractor you know and on these guns i'm sure you can find some parts for them but like mm -hmm. anything else that's you know 75 years old your parts are going to get hard to find the gas system on this one is adjustable uh we don't have a wrench but uh on this side here i'll roll it over you take this screw out and you take the uh hand guard off and you'll find the gas sleeve they make a little tool looks like a Looks like a little uh, can wrench, kind of. And uh, if you're having troubles with your cases, if the thing's not if the thing's not ejecting, or if it's ejecting too hard and it's bending the cases, or pulling the you know, ripping the cases off the, with the ejectors and stuff, 
then you need to do a little work with your, uh, and that's adjustable. This one has been, like I said, has been doing fine. I don't even know where it's set. I hadn't looked at it. But uh, uh, backing it off, it's got a sleeve right here that backs off with the wrench. And you, you back it off to get less pressure. And of course, you want it just to, uh, you want it to just to where if you've got some ammo you're going to shoot, if you've got a bunch of ammo you're going to shoot, you get it to where it'll just, e just eject. Once you get there, maybe about another half a crank or so more pressure. And uh, that's kind of how you fine tune it if you uh, if you're having troubles with it. And mm -hmm. Start out with it all the way back, and then work your way up until it starts functioning correctly, and then give it just a little scotch more there, and it, uh, it should work fine. And uh, a but, good cool thing to note is with the crest deals, um, a lot of different nations like Argentine, Belgium, uh, I know we, of course Egypt. I want to say Luxembourg also, you know, had their nation's crest on their shoe, which is another cool little touch they had. For these weapons, you know, it was all different crests and little emblems they had put on these things. So, you want to make sure I mention that just because that's kind of cool. Yeah, and that's uh, that's about all I can think of that that we've had. Like I said, we haven't, we don't have extensive knowledge of it, but from what we have learned, uh, ammo selection is important. Gas, your gas uh, recoil system uh, can be important if it's. Uh, if whatever you're shooting is not agreeing with it. And I also need to be careful about, you know, when you release the bolt, you don't want to actually get a, a slam fire from this thing, which that can happen. Yes, that's another thing. Uh, we we haven't had any trouble with that, but I have heard of it, so obviously it uh, is possible, and obviously it has has happened some. Is slamming when the bolt slams, there's been some, some uh, misfires, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, commercial ammo, I've read, I hadn't used any commercial ammo on this one, but Commercial ammo has softer primers, uh, generally speaking, and uh, this gun really should be, really you should use brass cased military spec ammo, uh, the non-Turkish variety with the faster burning powders <laughs> and the hard primers. And if you're going to reload, of course, I'm not a big reloader by any means, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you could reload your brass and, you know, use a hard, hard primer, you know, and, uh, Magnum primer, maybe whatever. Uh, use some kind of primer that's a little tougher, so you don't get a just have the least likely chance of having a, having the thing fire when the bolt closes, which I I wouldn't care for. <laughs> but anyway, am, uh, like I said, ammo selection, uh, keeping the gas system clean and adjusted. It's a it's a good gun. It shoots mm -hmm. great. I like it. I like shooting just about as well as an M1. I just nope. the M1's cooler. The M1's cooler. This is a better this weapon, is, probably. But. This is probably just as good of a weapon. Uh, M1 once you, just got the cool factor. Yeah, it's cool. I like the end blocks. I like them flipping out. I like that it's an M1. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd rather have an. I mean, if I had the choice, I'd say M1 for sure. But if I can have them both, which you have to do, have to do I like them both. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so, so it works out. Yeah. You know, if you can have them both, that's great. If you only have one, it's an M1. I'd say okay. that. Yeah, that's okay. what I'd say. All right, well, let's get this thing put back together and we'll be ready to start cooking with it here. All right. Yeah, just got a hole. Got a little bit pressure on it. Mm -hmm. Cool thing about this weapon, this is one of the last, you know gas operated semi automatic military rifles that was ever adopted by anybody. You know, after this weapon, most nations start switching to more of the assault rifle type of weapons for their military. So this is kind of, this gun right here kind of marks the end of an era in firearms history of kind of being one of the last, if not the last weapon adopted by a military that was not more of the assault rifle classification, which is kind of a cool deal, you know, kind of shows how we've transitioned over time to different weapons, you know. Oh, there you there go. we go, Glock tool. <laughs> there we go. You got to get her everything ginning right and get her in those grooves. Mm -hmm. Slide up in there. And then slide her in there. There's your recoil small. All right. Let's put that baby right in there. I'm going to work that. Get lined up with that. A little in there. Not to bring it forward, you know, and then bring yeah, it forward and down. These you'll see right here, these uh, catches. 
right here and here line it with these cuts right here. And we'll just slide it forward. Slide it forward a little bit. Catch it lined up. There we go. Now she's down and then backwards. Push that on the side. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Once she's back flush, levers off. And, and make then sure you turn that baby back down. Spin that baby and you'll feel it kind of catch right there. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see if the thing will work. Let's see if it'll cycle and do as it's supposed to. All right. Locks back. That's good. Okay. Looks good. It works. Looks good. All right. All well, right. She's back together. So now we'll... Uh, Take to the range and see how it does. All right. Thanks for watching this first part of the FM49 SAFN. Thank you.